What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, March 11th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, federal money could supercharge state efforts to preserve nuclear power. That's over in Michigan. We love that. Next up, green plating the grid. How utilities <laughs> exploit, quote, the energy transition to rake in refer- record profits. That's from our one of our favorite sub stacks, the Energy Bad Boys. They will be on our podcast later this week. We look forward to talking to them. Next up, Aramco in talks for U.S. LNG projects as Mideast gas uh, heats up. Next, bizarre geoengineering report floated to save the world from doomsday glacier. You can't make this stuff up anymore. And then we'll finish up the new segment with the banks, quote, unrealized losses in Q4 securities held by banks, bank failures, and the dropping bank count. Stu will do his best to tie this into energy or I will strangle him. No, I'm just kidding. But we appreciate uh, um the intense news lineup we've got he will then toss it over to me i will quickly cover what's going on and happened really on friday and over the weekend here um in the oil and gas markets we have seen bitcoin pop above seventy thousand. it's back below so everybody the commodities boom really is here oil's down a little bit right now the the, we'll we'll get the open here soon as we record this so lots going on with rig counts and, and and we'll dive into all that and a bag of chips guys as always i'm michael tanner joined by Stuart turley all right where do you want to start? Hey, let's start with some federal money. You know, what's a few billion between friends? Uh, a federal money could supercharge state efforts to preserve nuclear power. Michael, this is absolutely huge. Yep. Uh, even in a Democrat, Democrat Governor Gretchen Whitmer successfully pushed for $150 million in state funding last year for the Palisades restart. The plant is owned by Florida uh, Holtec international bought it in 2022 to decommission it michael and then you and i talked about a little while ago that they have actually snuck about uh, did a re uh, redone they were going to decommission it and then the decommissioning applied for federal money and they got the extra money to fire it back up that's pretty darn cool it's good. I mean, I, we're all for nuclear here. We're we're you excited bet. to hear about that. Wasn't Gret, Gretchen Whitmer the one that was abducted by all the feds? She, well, <laughs> it was. Oh, why? Yeah, I that was. There's actually a little conspiracy theory out there that says the the CIA did their own. Uh, they oh, were the ones that set it up. up to date with the conspiracy. I just, I, 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 I had to just point that out that I think Gretchen Whitmer was the one that the feds ab- attempted to abduct. The, what is it? Two out of the twelve people. <laughs> we're not fans. It's, like, it's just unbelievable. All right, back on track here, guys. We love the fact the quote is that um, this is from the chief of staff, uh, Kara Cook. She's over there at the Michigan Department of Environment, Green Lakes, and Energy. She says reviving the plant is really significant to make sure we can meet our clean energy goals. At least they've got some responsible people over there because you wouldn't, you're not hearing that coming out of California, no. and they have the exact same choice with Diablo Canyon right now. Well, uh, Diablo Kim did get an extension just recently, and there are six states, Connecticut, Illinois, Kentucky, Montana, West Virginia, and Wisconsin recently repealed bans on adding new nuclear in part to enable such reactors. Yes, you can't have wind, solar without nuclear. If you want to get rid of natural gas and fossil fuels, you have to have nuclear. But, you know, everybody has to remember, if you want your iPhone, you're going to need some oil and gas because you can't make oil. You can't make an iPhone out of a solar panel. (laughs) Or it's going to cost you five thousand dollars a month in Verizon fees before you your phone will cost a hundred (laughs) grand, which is very possible. Hey, let's roll over here. And a shout out to what's her name? Uh, Gretchen, you know, uh, for stay safe out there. Yeah, stay safe. Look out over your shoulder. Um, Okay. Hey, uh, green plating the grid, how utilities exploit the energy transition, rake in record profit. Michael, this is from Isaac Orr and Mitch Rowling. They are the energy bad boys. And I get a hoot out of reading their sub stack. I highly recommend everybody uh, go out and, and read what they've got going on. 
Um, here's where they go through. This is one of the single best descriptions of why wind and solar is being pushed by utilities. Let me read this part for you, Michael. Utilities are never going to rival tech companies or biotech companies in terms of growth, but this is the best utilities growth environment that we've seen in decades. When you combine those two big micro themes of electrification and clean energy, seeing utilities with growth like we haven't seen many, many years. These just aren't growth prospects for the next year or two. This is a growth that we can last for a decade or more. A lot of the clean energy goals and electrification goals are out there 2040, 2050. You look at the infrastructure investment that's needed to get to these goals. It's a long runway for utilities. Great quote. That's why the, the utilities are a good investment. But here's where a little bit later in here, uh, they start describing on the asset and the depletion of assets on this. When you take a look at the 30 year mark on a energy, I'm in the uh, Miss Producer, if you could slide over the one with the green arrows and a, uh, a downward. Yeah, the uh, depreciation schedule and utility corporate profits yep. over time. Really interesting because what this is showing yep. is the value of the plant over time relative to the corporate profits, which meaning as the longer you have a plant, the less profit is being made because you're paying off more and more of the plant, meaning the depreciation yep. is less offsetting your profit. So while at, and, and what they go on to say is a, a plant that is fully paid off has some of the lowest cost energy available to the consumer. But if you're a if you're a utility, it offers some <laughs> of the worst economics from your standpoint. So there's always a push to invest new money into capital, whether it's working or not, which is why you which is a really interesting point to show this is why everybody's been moving into wind and solar. They don't care if it works or not, because them spending on infrastructure allows them to fully depreciate and take advantage of this kind of accounting trick. You know, and, and I love that this is where we're at. We're innovating by making by taking advantage of the accounting that, you know, real, you know, that's usually yep. a business model that doesn't stick around too long when you're innovating on something other than at least a product. I mean, now right now, oh, we're able to grow because of an accounting trick. Oh, good luck. Oh, uh, they've done such a great job. And if you look down into the, the map from the Smart Electric Power Alliance shows the utilities have pledged to achieve 100% carbon free net negative net zero reduce emissions. Uh, Miss Producer, if you could slide this map in, um, take a look at that map and net zero or carbon neutral. Look at that big tan area in there, Michael. Yep. Look at all of California net negative. You've got either net zero or not net negative or a hundred percent carbon free. You're looking at the most expensive uh, uh, electricity in the entire planet yep. or the universe right there. No, it's, 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 it's crazy. All right. What's next? Okay. Hey, great job to those guys. Let's go to Saudi Aramco. Our buddies over there in Saudi Aramco in talks for U.S. LNG projects as Mideast gas race heats up. Uh, this is actually pretty cool. Uh, Saudi Aramco is in talks with uh, companies for the U.S. Um, Amin Nasir, he's the CEO uh, of uh, Saudi Aramco. Um, let's see here. They're also talking with uh, Abu, uh, Abu Dhabi uh, National Oil. Uh, let's see here. Arab uh, Air Emirates and Qatar. Um, they're looked at buying 25% of Sempra's Energy Port Arthur, uh, Arthur facility in Texas, but it was pulled back. So they're planning some bigger uh, things and looking at some more investments in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, well, because they're looking for the, their and their, China. Well, because I think they are seeing the shift globally to wow, LNG could become the long term. I if you play it out thirty years, 
LNG is probably the the the, the most commonly you will be continued to be the most commonly fuel used in the world. And I think they're trying to position themselves at the head of that. You've seen Qatar kind of take the lead. You've seen UAE take the lead. So it's about time Saudi stepped up a little bit. And I think they're recognizing the shift that's going on. I'll and what's what. interesting yeah. is I think they see the U.S. market. I don't know how it would work. And if they're, they're trying to get into the U.S. market, which clearly they see as, okay, if no more of these LNG facilities are going to get built in U.S., they're only going to become more valuable the ones that already exist. You're basically limiting the supply and therefore keeping the price. Now, what does that mean? There's going to be a lot of domestic LNG, but the stuff that gets exported, if you have a piece of that, that's really where we saw the arbitrage come in, specifically when you saw what was going on with the prices in Europe. So it's yep. a smart move. Extremely smart. And we've already seen um, uh, Total Energies, uh, as we say, uh, by sick uh, enough natural gas power plants in Texas enough to have uh, two nuclear reactors. Uh, that's a lot of gigawatts, dude. And that they've been so you're seeing foreign energy companies investing into U.S. energy projects. Hey, let's roll around the corner here to this one. Is I had to get into a conspiracy theory. You can't beat this kind of entertainment. I saw this and rolled over in the floor. My wife had to wonder what I was doing. I had a hernia. I was laughing. Listen to this one, Michael. Bizarre geoengineering project floated to save the world from a doomsday glacier. I didn't change anything. There you are drinking your seltzer. <laughs> okay, let's take a look at this thing. Uh, the glacier in question is known as the uh, Tuates Glacier, a Great Britain-sized hunk located in western Antarctica. It's been nicknamed the Doomsday Glacier by climate zealots because it can be subject to warmer ocean currents. Ooh, dun, 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 dun. They're looking at putting in a global curtain the glacier curtain is the brainchild of john moore a glaciologist from the university of lapland in finland what in the world is a glaciologist i was gonna say what do you have to study to become a glaciologist i don't know do you brush your teeth twice a day i don't know his main issue the earth's two large ice sheets in antarctica and greenland will deteriorate Ooh. I'm getting warmer already. Um, scenarios of the climate change projection into the future. This deterioration has already begun for Antarctica and Greenland. Uh, unbelievable. Okay, the curtain, they want $50 billion in order uh, to do this. Now we figure it out. $50 it's, billion. That makes sense. Okay, you cool. You bet. Uh, and it's it's a climate scam. They want to put a curtain around this thing. The concept of geoengineering as a solution is nothing more than a money grab by sharp. Put a curtain around it. Isn't that the same thing as like them them saying we want to shoot stuff into the atmosphere to stop climate change? Like, okay, that sounds like a worse idea to put a curtain around this thing. I mean, oh. this all comes back to the point of if this what what do they call it the the, the Thwadis Glacier. Yep. If that were to fall in Western Antarctica into the ocean, they're claiming 10 foot sea level rise. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, the Obamas are on four feet, you know. Why, if the Obamas thought that they were going to have an ocean rise up, why would they buy something four feet? The smartest thing somebody ever told me is the insurance industry never loses money. There's one industry throughout the last 60 years that has always made money. It's the insurance industry. If we were all it's doomed, the ins you would never be able to get house insurance to for something on the beach. The fact exactly. that you can get affordable house insurance on coastline Tells you all you need to know. The smartest people, the most amount of data in the world, the insurance business, still will give you house insurance, flood insurance. Hey, whatever, you know. So, do you did you think with your comment that just as we talked about, there's probably a toe tag on the EV market since insurance is putting a toe. They're stopping EVs. Interesting. I did not know that they're stopping. Uh, they're stopping they, they've doubled the insurance and tripled the insurance on EVs. 
Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Ooh. Well, so. sure. And and what I tell these guys, this this uh, what's his name, John Moore? Is yeah. That his name, John Moore. I'm trying yep. to look. Yeah, John Moore, University of Lapland. Yeah, I'd like fifty billion too, man. So it's a few billion between friends. Yeah. Hey, we we could spend a billion of that 50 on a survey and then have it falsified and pay for that. Then you could bribe the judges so that you could get out of jail and still have we could pay taxes on a 25 billion and still have 25 billion on our in our pockets. That's not a bad deal for the for the economy. It's great. All right. Let's go to the next yeah, one here. What he said. What's next? <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. The banks unrealized losses. <laughs> the banks unrealized in Q4 securities held banks, bank failures and the dropping of bank count. This one is by uh, Wolf Richard at the Wall Street. He is a good cat. Uh, I like reading his articles and stuff. And so. When you come in in here and you take a look in Q4, unrealized losses on securities fell by 206 or 30% from the prior quarter to a cumulative loss of $478 billion or 8.8% of the $5.43 trillion in securities held by those banks. Um Unbelievable. These paper losses started piling up in 2022. <laughs> so when you come down in here, uh, the bank failures, the bank failure issue, Michael, is going to be some serious issues coming around the corner. And back in 1936, there were only five uh, failures without FDIC insured banks uh, in 20 and 21. No bank failed. In 2018, no bank failed. 26 and 2005, bank failed, and that was it. So each of the remaining of the 88 years, some bank failed. Uh, in 1989, at the peak, uh, 531 banks failed. Holy smokes. Yeah, I think these, you know, these unrealized losses that he's talking about, he does a good job, in, in my opinion, of splitting them up. You have to think yep. about there's, there's, we, there's what we call mature, uh, securities or losses that are held in these at in mm. these securities that are what are known as held to maturity, which means they're not going to sell them ever. They're going to hold them out until the life of that, you know, security or really it's that 10 year treasury bond pays back. Because remember, you, there's really only so many different ways. If you're talking about government issued um, bonds or treasury securities, those are specifically the 10 and two year yield, which, you know, occasionally in the finance section, I'll throw those numbers out. And that's important to know because those are generally when they buy those treasuries, that's what they're talking about. So there are certain ones that are held to maturity, but then there's also ones that are available that anybody can buy that they basically put on the market. Those actually, um, um, those are make up of over half of the unrealized loss. So you, you've got to, you know, so there, there, there's on both sides of the coin here, you, you've got stuff going and, and, you know, the accounting trickery or whatever between the, the held to maturity ones or the ones that are available is a little bit good, but, yeah, I mean, it, it it's going to get spicy. This is, a again, comes back to when, what does it mean when the Fed's tightening monetary policy? They're raising rates. I mean, we all know that. We've right. talked about, you know, we've talked about at nauseum about how that's sort of, that's what that's what's happening over in China a little bit. And that's what's causing some of this, the stuff that's going on. It's a little bit different over there because of the debt loads here. But we know that the Fed has been very aggressive at raising rates. And right. it seems to be for the the stock market is at all time highs or close to all time highs seems to be trending upward, but it, it definitely, you know, the, the, the tune over here is interest rates. Where will they go? Because if they continue to rise or stay at, if these are long-term levels of where interest rates are going to be, these unrealized losses are going to continue to pile up because we just came out in an era of seven years or eight years of 0% interest rates. And that's only, going that it's going to take a while to unwind and it's and and these unrealized losses will continue to persist if only because that unwind is only in its infancy yeah it, and i like uh what he says down here at the bottom in 2024 some banks will fail we pretty much know that we just don't know how many if eight banks fail that would be on par with 2015 and 2017 so uh he's pretty cool cat 
yeah, no, go, go, go chafe Wolf Street to follow. We appreciate that. All right. That's it for me, baby. All right. Well, we'll pop over and talk about what happened on Friday. You know, we saw, you know, overall the markets were down about one and a half percentage points for the NASDAQ. Uh, S&P 500 trades down about uh, six tenths of a percentage point. Um, we saw the the, the two year yield down about uh, six tenths of a percentage point. Ten year yields only down about two tenths of a percentage point. Dollar index flat. Um, Bitcoin, the big mover over the weekend, it's it was up above 70,000, now just a little bit below 69,422 um, for that. Um, crude oil, not a great day, down about 1.1 percentage points uh, for the close on Friday, 78. Oh, one looks to open somewhere a little bit below that, you know, mainly just due to the fact that, you know, as, as I met, uh, you know, What's funny is, you know, the, the the story at the beginning of the week and what drove prices above 80 was the fact that OPEC plus decided to extend its supply cuts, which we, you know, Saudi kept the, the little sugar on top. We saw the UAE, <laughs> you know, we saw a lot more, you know, even Russia came in and said, hey, we're going to we're going to bring less oil to the markets. Now, Stu would argue that they're just going to sell it around the back end to get around sanctions. And so, sure, there's where your dark fleet comes into play. I think it'll be, you know. What I think we saw to close the week out was a little bit more of, okay, let's take a step back and now look at the macro environment. We, you know, the, 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 you know, we have what's going on in China continuing to, to sway things. But again, I don't think, I think yesterday's price action or Friday's price action, excuse me, has more to do with just the unknown of what's happening going forward. I mean, we have, we, we, we've seen less and less geopolitical craziness rolling out. And I think that's playing more into, you know, obviously where, the, the, the forward sentiment of where things are going in the Middle East seem to, you know, and maybe it's just because just like in Ukraine, we just get tired of hearing about it. So maybe it's it's the fact that we're not hearing about it, but there's it, it seems to be things have calmed down a little bit in that region from the, a geopolitical standpoint when it comes to how it applies to oil and gas. Obviously, what's going on there is a tragedy and specific, and Ukraine as well. But from how that's affecting the geopolitical oil markets, it seems to be slowing down a little bit which is going to only soften oil prices if really the extended supply cuts were already what they're doing if you know if if, if OPEC decides to come in and cut more and add more sugar on top of it you know and 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 then maybe yes so I, I think it's Stu it's a really interesting dynamic on what we have going on right right now with prices um, we also did see rig count numbers drop um, in the United States and abroad, we saw Canada drop six rigs to 225. U.S. dropped seven rigs down to 200 or 622 internationally. We also saw a dip of seven. So obviously, you know, these rig counts are these rigs are coming offline, I think, for a couple of reasons. One, in the United States, we're seeing a lot of natural gas rigs shut down. We saw Chesapeake and their new merged Southwestern come out and say, yeah, no, we're going to only run two rigs and only one frack crew, which was basically cut in half on both sides. Um, we saw EQT come out and shut in a billion B or a BCF per day. And you can only imagine they're shedding rigs as we speak. Um, you know, in Canada, obviously, we, we, we've, you know, um, we, we've seen some of those spreads come down. I'm a little bit unfamiliar um, with with some of the big happenings up there in Canada, but but you know everything in this market again rolls you know thirty days behind. So these decisions to cut rigs, you can't do it at a snap of a finger. So where was prices thirty days ago were were softer than they are now? It, you you we were in this in the lower seventies about thirty days ago. So I think that's part of what is you're, you see reflected in a lot of these rig count numbers. Um, we did see a lot of earnings roll out this week. Nothing that I thought was interesting. Ring Energy dropped theirs. It really was, you know, kind of a catch up um, to what's going to happen. You know, Ring Energy had some, you know, interesting, interesting stuff. We'll let you guys read that on Newsbeat. But that's really all I've got, Stu. It was a little bit quiet on Friday. We're ready to rock and roll this week, though. So lots of great stuff coming up. Oh, absolutely. Buckle up. Buckle up. You got anything else <laughs> before we let them go? Oh, no. It's going to be a fantastic Monday. Absolutely. So with that, guys, we'll let you get out of here. I uh, appreciate you guys checking us out. World's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com.